the time. So we was running low on water, we was running low on food. So we pretty much had to ration everything, you know, um, including ammunition. Each of these bases had just a few score Paras, Royal Irish Rangers or Gurkhas. As they fought off attacks day and night, this struggle obliterated the bigger picture. Put the clue on! Another one, just take the, leave the clue there, get the missile. I think we didn't appreciate that. They would focus round the district centres. They were acting as breakwaters. Reacting to a series of crises had become a strategy. So what happened in many of these places was that only a very small area could come under the influence of the troops that were up here, while all around them, the insurgents moved. The soldiers nicknamed their enemy Terry Taliban, but they faced a mixture of gunmen hired by the drug lords, hardcore jihadists and local farmers. Regular Taliban, they were employing what we uh, termed as a $10 Taliban. They'd pay them $10, give them a weapon to come and hit, hit hitters with. Um, I, I think a lot of them were on, um, on drugs as well, because when they did get hit, a lot of them didn't fall, they just kept firing. We poked a hornet's nest, and they came out biting. Um, we didn't have enough people on the ground. Now, we were massively stretched at the time. It was one battle group to pretty much cover the whole of Helmand. I asked on a daily, weekly basis, for more troops, more capability, more helicopters. I remember saying to the Chief of Defence Staff in 2006 on one of his visits that we needed probably a division size, 10,000 troops, to achieve what we'd set out to do. We increased the size of our deployed forces in Afghanistan as rapidly as we could, given the fact that we were trying to balance Afghanistan, Iraq, and the overall pressure on the British military. Some small-scale reinforcements were sent, but they were trying to hold an area half the size of England with little over 1,000 combat soldiers. Now you've got some 30,000 NATO troops holding a roughly similar area, but it shows the scarcity of resources and the stretch that we faced that we held that ground with about 1,200 men. outnumbered, they could only hold on by calling in air power and artillery. The insurgents needled the British into laying waste to areas they'd been sent to protect. We acknowledged that there was more destruction than construction uh, going on in the places we were trying to help build and, and bring security and governance. Some of his men even question what good it all did. Uh, fucking zero. Zero. We demonstrated to the insurgents that uh, we weren't going to take a beating. We certainly weren't going to withdraw from that area. But in terms of bringing reconstruction and development to the area, clearly that not a huge amount was achieved uh, simply because of uh, the efforts of the insurgents to, to thwart that. The Kajaki Dam and power plant was one of the most important places in Helmand. It was here that deep flaws in Britain's operation would be exposed. Despite its value, Colonel Tootle only had a few dozen men to secure the dam. On the morning of the 6th of September, they launched an operation. The idea was to send out a sniper team to intercept some insurgents who were manning an illegal checkpoint. And they came down the slope and through the valley there, down below. I heard the explosion, I mean... So I knew, I knew straight away that that was a mine. Sergeant Pearson's team had wandered into an old Russian minefield and he went to rescue them in the minefield. 
Almost as soon as the incidents have started, the troops on the ground quite rightly identified the need for a winch-equipped Black Hawk helicopter. However, we were then told that wasn't available. The British didn't have any in the inventory. Took my foot, slipped or whatever off a rock and put it in the sand and stood straight in my mind. And my left leg was gone straight away. I knew exactly what I'd done. Um, and I got blown up a bit, spun round and landed and lifted my leg to see what was gone and seeing it was gone at um, roughly at boot height because my top lace was still attached to my, my leg, or the remainder of my leg. A third mine detonated just beside myself. Mark Wright caught a lot of that. Mark would keep morale up, he'd be shouting at us, um, and then we'd be having a laugh and a joke. And one of the lads, uh, Dave Prosser, it turned out it was his birthday, so we managed to sing happy birthday for him. But while the search for a suitable helicopter went on, men were bleeding to death. Eventually, uh, we got the two Black Hawk helicopters, three, almost three and a half hours after we'd asked for them, and did exactly what we needed them to do, and they airlifted the casualties out by winching some very brave American paramedics into the minefield. And then Mark shouted to me, if I die, tell Gillian and my uncle and my family that I love them. And I just shouted back, shut up, Mark. It's time next week we're going to be back in the pub because we don't want to hear something like that. When I eventually got winched up, I think I was after Mark, and I looked beside me and Mark was there and I was like, thank Christ that's over. Mark Wright died of his wounds on the way to Bastion. He's definitely one of the, if not the bravest bloke I've ever had the pleasure of working with. The one thing that probably was the most emotional thing in a very emotional tour that stood out for me was as we filed out of the makeshift chapel in the tent, Mark's best friend, Corporal Lee Parker, stopped and ruffled his hair. We always rip each other. I mean, my, my best mate, Peter, when he came to visit me, uh, I'd just been moved out of intensive care. He visited me, gave me a a parrot and an eye patch, and a copy of Runners Weekly, which I thought was a touch. Later that evening, attacks on Sangin and then Musakala led to even more casualties. Their only hope of survival was evacuation by helicopter. Yeah. Okay, you're descending, they're making descending. Okay, 200 feet again. But every time they went in to pick up the wounded, they ran the very real risk of being shot down. During that day, the para battle group lost three soldiers killed and suffered 18 wounded. But because of what they went through that day, commanders increasingly asked themselves about whether the risks of losing one of those helicopters could still be run. My biggest concern was losing one of the very few Chinook troop-carrying helicopters, particularly if it had 50 or 60 soldiers as well as the crew, and they could have been lost in a heartbeat. Losing a helicopter would put the whole Helmand operation at risk. The Paras simply couldn't hold on everywhere, and as is now revealed, London felt the risks in Musakala were too high. So while in London you don't interfere with commanders on the ground, in this particular case I certainly did intervene, and I certainly did say, um, you've got to get us out of Musakala. The British made a face-saving deal. They agreed to withdraw if the local leaders promised to keep the Taliban out of Musakala. The local commander was unhappy, Karzai was unhappy, everybody was unhappy save for the insurgents. It was, uh, it was an unfortunate deal. They withdrew in civilian trucks. They weren't armoured. Although we trusted the elders, it was the Taliban we did, certainly didn't trust. The guys felt it was quite stressful for them. Some of the younger guys couldn't understand the situation. We lost three people, uh, and certain loads injured. And it, but it certainly didn't sit well with some of the guys. 
The deal held for a few months, but in February 2007, the Taliban had returned and set up a shadow Helmand government in Musakala. We could not cede pieces of ground uh, to the insurgent the way we had done there. It was a bold move to stick uh, those platoons out, but, but it was, in retrospect, not the smartest of tactics simply because you didn't have the force uh, to back it up. But sustaining um, a deployment that was not in the long-term operational interests of the mission just because you didn't want to get a bit of egg on your face would have been insane. But a chorus of armchair criticism started too, and, and we heard some of that. Had they dealt out too much destruction? Had they seriously alienated the very people that Britain was trying to win over? Yeah. Towards the end of 2006, the Royal Marines replaced the Paras. That was exactly where, the, exactly where the fire was coming from. Right. The government did send 700 additional infantry and a few more helicopters. Adopting their own new tactic, the commandos formed mobile groups to seek out guerrilla bands before they could attack the district centres. Getting closer. They're getting closer. Scotty boss, stand by for burst, over. They went to where they knew the enemy were waiting, a tactic they called advancing to ambush. Halfway between the large tree. Many of them loved it because the Afghans would give them a stand-up fight. The commando's tour finished with fresh claims of hundreds of Taliban killed. It was unclear if they'd regained the initiative and their successors certainly thought they had a better solution. The British used six-month tours, so twice every year, new commanders adopted new tactics for their new mission in Helmand. It meant that the policy meandered around, so when three commando brigade arrived, leaving behind their dagger, they wanted to get moving again. They felt the paratroopers were too fixed in those platoon houses and district centres. Twelve brigade then arrived, and they were moving all right, up and down the province, but their own commander described the effects as being like mowing the grass. They'd cut down the enemy and move on, so the insurgents would just return, as nobody stayed to stop them. Then, six months later, a new brigade arrived with its own ideas and aims. General McNeil, commanding all NATO forces in Afghanistan, found the year-long U.S. Army tours more effective. I fought the six months tour. It did not work in the favor of the operational concepts and tactical concepts that the British military had in Helmand. I stand by that. The commandos were followed by 12 Brigade. Among them, the Queen's Company Grenadier Guards. Sergeant Major Glenn Snazzle was filmed in 2007 when they were deployed to knock the Afghan army into shape. He soon discovered some Afghan soldiers, or ANA, when given a gun, were more of a threat to their own side than the enemy. I'm going out on a morning patrol and one of the ANA soldiers shot himself through the foot, which subsequently shot a dog, uh, ricocheted off the wall and he shot some of our guys. And that's what we were up to on a daily basis with the ANA. The Grenadiers pushed the Afghan army in the toughest classroom, combat. And they adopted another new approach, challenging the insurgents where most of them lived, in the lush, irrigated land, the so-called green zone. When you go into the green zone, um, there's a, a feeling of vulnerability. There was a lot of vegetation, a lot of cover from view. It was just... Um, a myriad of irrigation ditches um, and a lot of compounds were dotted around the area as well. You almost feel like the enemy have got eyes on you, but you haven't got eyes on them. That's RPGs being fired. We came under contact. It was heavy contact. 
and it, it went on through the day. Team one, casualty! Team one! 